room here, uh, particularly right here on the front row, for those who are looking for a seat. There's, there's, there's room for the brave up front. All right, well, let's begin. Uh, welcome to today's panel on the Defense Industrial Base and Federated Defense. Uh, I'm Andrew Hunter. I am the uh, new director of the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group uh, here at CSIS, and I'm going to be the moderator for this uh, session. Our discussion this morning uh, is a key part of the overall 2014 Global Security Forum focus on the top challenges facing U.S. and global security. Uh, we're going to focus on some of the emerging and structural and ongoing budgetary dynamics uh, that are driving changes in the Department of Defense industry relationship. And particularly, we're going to have a bit of a focus today on uh, something that uh, we call federated defense. And that's a concept that I'm going to explain in more detail in just a bit. Before I do that, uh, what I'd like to do is introduce our panel. Uh, we have an outstanding panel of industry leaders uh, with deep experience um, on a whole a wide range of issues, including uh, our topic this morning. Uh, they have experience in the highest levels of government and in industry, um, and particularly uh, a lot of experience in the globalization of industry uh, and the defense and aerospace sector uh, that we're going to focus on a bit this morning. So please join me in welcoming them. In, wel welcoming them. Uh, first, we have uh, William J. Lynn III, former Deputy Secretary of the Department of Defense and CEO of Finn Mechanica North America and DRS Technologies. Uh, we have uh, Robert J. Stevens, the retired chairman and chief executive officer of Lockheed Martin Corporation. Clayton Jones, former chairman and CEO Rockwell Collins. And Pierre Chow, uh, managing partner and founder of the Renaissance Strategic Advisors and a senior advisor to the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group at CSIS and a former director. Now, before we get into, uh, before we go further, let me just say a word about this concept of federated defense to kind of baseline the discussion and kind of define terms, if you will. Uh, CSI has kicked off a, a, a major project on federated defense about this time last year. Uh, it includes a series of reports and discussions and dialogues, of which this is, this is one. Uh, so federated defense is a concept for taking security cooperation, which is something that the U.S. has done for quite a long time um, between, with our allies and partners and taking it to a deeper level uh, where uh, the nations involved in select mission areas uh, would uh, be designing and uh, organizing and to some extent equipping their capabilities uh, with the idea that they would be working cooperatively. And so these capabilities would be complementary and reinforcing uh, in support of common strategic interests and security interests. This approach would be not just bilateral, but also multilateral, um, and involve a range of similarly interested parties, building on existing alliances and partnerships around the world. The approach would uh, potentially involve enhanced training, logistics support, tactics development, and uh, uh, ultimately, potentially, to include combined operational missions. However, it wouldn't be integrated so tightly that individual nations would be unable to engage in autonomous missions when they so desire. So this is not a straitjacket that means that countries can only act uh, cooperatively, but it's something that enables them to enact cooperatively when they so desire. Now, the work done on federated defense so far has uh, really identified six uh, key mission areas uh, where uh, the, the folks that have been part of this dialogue believe federated defense approach may pay dividends. And examples of those are uh, humanitarian assistance disaster response, information and intelligence sharing, maritime security, undersea warfare, missile defense, and cybersecurity. And each of these missions areas uh, represents a space where there is uh, a strong alignment of U.S. security interests with partners and allies where there's the opportunity for deep cooperation involved uh, in the federated defense concept, and where there's a gap that a cooperative approach can help address, a capability gap that needs to be closed. Now, one of the last aspects of the federated defense concept that bears heavily on this morning's discussion is leveraging and incorporating global value chains. And by global value chain, um, I'm referring to production networks that are distributed globally 
and that leverage specialized capabilities that are resident in multiple nations. Uh, so as is increasingly the case, the United States-based uh, industry does not have a monopoly on good technology, and in certain um, technologies, the, the leading edge may in fact be located elsewhere. So the concept of a global value chain is leveraging uh, those areas of expertise uh, and combining them into a, into a whole, uh, an end product, end item. The commercial industry in many areas is high le highly leveraging global value chains, uh, but their use in the national security arena is less, uh, and their significant barriers and constraints, such as domestic contact content requirements, export controls, uh, and foreign disclosure constraints uh, that make that difficult. So in the work done on federated defense so far, increased utilization of global value chains appears to be a key enabler to a federated defense approach. With that limited background, I wanted to tee up this discussion. Uh, let me lay out first how we're going to proceed, and then, and then we'll move into it. Each panelist will spend a few minutes talking about the key issues uh, that they see emerging in the DOD industrial relationship and related challenges and opportunities for federated defense. Uh, we'll then move into a 20-minute panel discussion of these issues, uh, and then after that we'll open up uh, to the audience for questions with the remaining time, and we'll finish at 12.15, and we'll be the last thing standing between you and lunch. So uh, first, let's hear from uh, former Deputy Secretary of Defense Lynn. told me the test was whether I turned on the button before I spoke. Uh, thanks very much, Andrew. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. Uh, let me start by uh, putting things uh, in a longer-term context. I, I think every generation or so, you hit a point where you're, you're on the cusp of structural change in the, in the industrial base. And I think there are, are forces building towards that over the next, uh, the remainder of this decade. We've had a couple of prior changes, uh, the, the biggest two being one in, at the beginning of World War II when we changed from a arsenal shipyard, largely government controlled uh, industrial base to one that was uh, based in the, largely in the commercial sector, largely in conglomerates. Uh, we had a second uh, evolution at the end of the Cold War in the, the famous Last Supper that Bill Perry held at the Pentagon, when we moved from that conglomerate structure more to a structure of, uh, centered around defense specialists, including a couple of the companies uh, represented uh, here today. I think now, as I said, forces are gathering to change uh, things again, and I, those forces are three. One is the, the budget reductions. We've gone down a little over 20% since the peak in, uh, in 2008. We're, I think, going to go, go still further with the uh, uh, sequestration, maybe not much further. But the and budget cuts alone, though, wouldn't normally force a structural change in industry. We've had budget cuts, uh, uh, prior evolutions, and the industry structure adapts and adjusts. It gets a little smaller, it gets a little bigger. But I, I think when you combine those budget reductions with two other factors, one is the, uh, what Andrew was talking about with federated defense, the globalization of the defense marketplace. It's no longer viable for even a market as large as the US to rely wholly on homegrown products and technologies. Has to look o overseas to other nations both for technology and for competition. The industrial base itself isn't big enough in, in several sectors, for, or the, the, the budget base isn't big enough to support uh, multiple domestic contractors, but the global base is big enough to support multiple international contractors. So if you want uh, competition, you look at a global marketplace. Similarly, all the best technology is not based here, uh, particularly when you look at the, the value chain that Andrew was talking about. Some of the best technologies are going to come from overseas. So if, if we want to maintain the technological edge that's been the hallmark of our military since World War II and beyond, we need to have a global approach to the marketplace. So that's, that's a second factor changing things. The third factor, I think, is the growing commercialization of defense technology. For you know, decades during the Cold War, defense was really a net exporter of technology, whether it was GPS, the origins of the internet itself. There, a lot of the technology that was developed inside defense, inside defense R&D, was then pushed out, and there were commercial applications. 
Uh, that still happens, but it's less and less, and I think a more dominant uh, trend now is there are developments in the commercial side, there are commercial technologies, 3D printing, nanotechnology, the broader sphere of information technology itself, where defense needs to pull those technologies in and operationalize them for military use. And again, I think if we're going to maintain our technological edge, we're going to have to get very good at that particular operation. So though in my mind, what's happening is those three forces, budget reductions, globalization, commercialization, are driving us towards, over the next few years, structural changes in the defense. And I think the policy uh, challenge for a panel like this and more broadly for the department and industry over the next few years is how do we adapt to and manage that change? In the prior two changes I cited, World War II and the Last Supper, those, those structural changes were actually ma managed extremely well. And, and the U.S. ended up with an ever stronger military and a stronger industrial base supporting it. I think the challenge we face is to achieve the same result. All right, thank you. Uh, Bob Stevens. Hey, thanks, Andrew. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'd be very hard-pressed uh, this morning to offer you an example from the programs with which I have familiarity that don't have a fairly substantial uh, segment of the program that um, has come from a global supply chain. In fact, most of the very high technology programs that I've been uh, associated with have significant international content. I don't think there's any concern um, if we envision an environment where governments have aligned security interests and objectives and they can define their roles and responsibilities in those objectives. And further, they can determine what systems and support and services they need and specify the requirements there and access a global supply chain and have the supply side of the industry bring together uh, the very best solutions. I, I think governments should, in every case, do that to the maximum extent possible. And it's hard to argue with constructs when those constructs facilitate a market that is more creative, more innovative, generating higher levels of performance and, and better value for customers. I hope that in our discussion today we can explore a couple of the parameters that I think, as I understand uh, this federated defense concept, that would be specifically uh, of importance here. The first is the clear recognition that while we like to think about defense acquisition in the same way we think about a broader market context, there are many, many reasons why defense is unique. Among them, the nature of the defense industrial base for most countries is central to their definition of security and sovereignty. And that's not likely to go away no matter how we orchestrate the architecture of the defense industrial base. It's the highest priority of the governments that I've interfaced with, and I think appropriately so. There is this issue in my mind in a, in a very complex global security environment that seems to be getting more complicated as to how much governments are investing in their security, even if the security interests and objectives align. And I think the data shows there's diminishing investment in security, and that's going to affect the size and composition of the market and the overall vitality of the market. Um, I do uh, recognize, Andrew, you laid out a number of what I regard as familiar to all of us uh, policy issues, like um, technology release policy. Uh, or um, uh, export uh, controls and, and such things, um, whether or not participants in the industrial base sign up to standards of ethics and business conduct and whether there's rigor in those standards or not. All, all of those would also be a determinant. Um, and then I guess I think in the world that we face today with increasing volatility, even when governments align, Given the dynamic nature of the world we see, I have a question as to how tight that alignment can be, how reliable we can be as partners over time, government to government, and how reliable we can be as an industrial base with one another over time as we respond to the challenges in this very dynamic and changing global security environment. So I hope that this discussion this morning can 
facilitate some further consideration of those points as we try to define what a federated defense environment might look like. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Clay Jones. Thanks, Andrew, and uh, good morning. Uh, today we're blessed on the panel to have two uh, extraordinary uh, representatives from major defense companies, global defense companies that operate on the prime sub prime supplier level, and I think they'll be excellent spokesmen for the role of federated defense in uh, their products and, and in those kind of systems. Today, I think my role is to speak perhaps as a supplier or a subsystems provider and see how the applicability of a federated defense concept would work. And in fact, what I can tell you is uh, for, for our company, uh, and especially those doing business in the electronics area, which our company did, uh, we've been operating under this sort of concept, I'd say, for the last two decades or, or more. And I think we were perhaps early leaders in this, uh, unbeknowing uh, we were doing it, uh, because of the context in which we operate. We typically operate at a lower level in the Pentagon, uh, which lets fewer barriers associated with what we do. Those those, uh, that visibility tends to be somewhat less political. Uh, and we, in the electronics area, have a natural commercial bias because of the kind of products and components that we operate in. And so, as in a good example of how this has evolved, I can go back two decades ago with the advent of a new technology at the time uh, called liquid crystal displays. And all of you have those displays in your home and your TV set. And in fact, it was the commercial market for TVs that drove this technology to be put in place. The Pentagon recognizing the advantages of lower weight, uh, higher complexity of, of display, and ultimately lower cost, saw this as a technology that needed to put into its systems, but feared that being dependent on foreign sources, which at the time were mostly coming out of Japan and then Korea, would be in some way uh, a hazard to national defense. So it spent hundreds of millions of dollars trying to set up a U.S. base capability for liquid crystal displays, which failed miserably. The market obviously couldn't adapt to that. It was done primarily for military use and had no commercial uh, bent or capability that it could distribute the cost and, and drive the development for. And as a result, we've seen market forces, not any policy, but market forces evolve over that two-decade period where literally every modern weapon system that we're producing now, the F-35, the F-22, which converted to LCDs, is using liquid crystal displays, all of which are sourced outside the United States. This was also brought to bear uh, when we recently experienced a tsunami in Japan, and we had to immediately react to make sure that our base of supply for all of our military systems and commercial systems would be maintained. And we found that we had literally hundreds of suppliers in Japan not all of which, but some of which were affected by the tsunami, many of which were sole source parts. And so what I would tell you based on my experiences is we already have a very well-established federated defense system in some of the supplier areas, and certainly in the electronics area that we're dealing with and which can, I think, grow over time. Now, where I think federated defense certainly can play a role, uh, if we look at the discussions that I've listened to this morning in this panel, they've all been focused on the uh, reduction in funding that we're seeing in the United States for military systems. And an inordinate amount of time has been spent on something that virtually no one of the attendees that attend this conference can do or will do anything about. And that is trying to get Congress to figure out how to do it better and get more funds. Uh, Rather than that, I think, we would spend our time more productively in seeing how we can address those problems that are under our control that will allow us to live within whatever funding and whatever oversight that the Congress will naturally apply to what we do. And so I think that there have been a number of issues addressed that are common themes. How do we innovate? How can we maintain competition? And how can we ultimately make weapon systems more affordable. And I think in all of those cases, there are concrete steps that can be taken without congressional oversight that can improve in each one of those areas. I would submit that uh, one of the best reports I've read here of late 
was published this summer by that Defense Business Board, of which Pierre is a member, and which, if you heard Secretary uh, work this morning, he was a big advocate of using the Defense Business Board. And this was specifically a report on how to maintain innovation, specifically using commercial approaches that Bill talked about in his. Now, I was disappointed in the opportunity, the question that uh, Secretary uh, Work had this morning about how do we improve the acquisition change that he didn't reference this report or talk specifically about the recommendations which I think would make dramatic improvements in the way that we buy and the way that we innovate and the way that we use the, the innovative base that exists not only in the United States but around the world. So let me take the liberty, if I can, of, of picking four specific areas, both out of this report and my own thinking, that perhaps we can talk about a little bit more during the Q&A session. The first is a more modular approach to development, uh, using more open systems and the ability to upgrade these systems more eloquently. There's not a single, I'll call it aircraft weapon system that's being developed that doesn't come replete with an avionic suite that is obsolete by the time it reaches operational development. The F-22 was one, the F-35 is becoming one, because that system cannot be fielded and moved in a time that would meet the advances that we see in avionics or electronics opportunities. And so if you design and build a system that allows itself to be modularized and updated, you would save a lot of time and money and get more capability along the way if you do that. The second uh, one that to be redundant of what Bill said is the more use of commercial practices, uh, especially in electronics and I'd say many other fields in the areas of uh, even metallics and, and, and uh, engine manufacturing. A lot of the advances that we're seeing right now are being done in the commercial marketplace, sometimes the commercial aerospace marketplace, sometimes the consumer marketplace. The ability of the Pentagon to use commercial practices and to attract commercial uh, firms is paramount. By the way, we figured this out 20 years ago when FASA was passed in 1994, and there are already regulations, FAR Part 12, that are on the books in the Defense Department if they just take advantage of them. Instead, what we see in the department is an attempt to rewrite FASA to remove the of a type uh, clauses that allow that adaption to be made from commercial, pure commercial, to commercial military use. The third area is incentives. I think the incentives, as they're currently structured, are not as productive as they can be. I've been a big advocate of use of more fixed price contracts. I think that would be a better way to do it. If you think about cost-based contracts, and they do have their purpose in certain areas, a cost-based con uh, contract has incentives in all the wrong places. The only way as a supplier that you can increase revenues and therefore profitability is to add cost. Now, no contractor goes in with the conscious effort to increase the cost of these weapon systems. But the system itself is insidious in allowing that to happen because the operator is always going to want more capability. It's almost like you listening to an ad for pharmaceuticals on the TV. If it'll cure your problem, you want to go get some and you'll use that name brand pharmaceutical. Same thing here, if we go in, the operator wants it, then the supplier is not gonna turn that down and the system allows that to happen. The use of fixed price contractors and controlling configurations, I think is a far better way to make sure the incentives are aligned better. And then finally, communications. I would say, having been a 40 year veteran of the defense business, I've never seen communication with the industry be in a worse state than it is today. Today, getting access to people in the Pentagon to have open, candid, and straightforward conversations is extraordinarily difficult. And if you happen to get that meeting, there's almost certainly a lawyer in the room that is not facilitating. And so I think we need to think about forums that would allow new ideas and new practices and processes to come to the table that would be helpful for both of us. Thank you. Pierre Chow. So um, it, it's a topic, I think, that has um, a blend of issues as usual, and, and it's important to sort of peel them apart. Um, you know, policy issues, uh, uh, conceptual issues, mythology, um, as well as I think a, a reality. Uh, it, it's, it's a notion that, that loops around, I think, when budgets get tighter, as Clay sort of noted. Um, the Europeans have been 
and the European Defense Agency has been struggling with this topic. Um, CSIS has been involved in, in that dialogue with the Europeans. And I think it's onshoring itself onto us as we sit there and stare at a more austere you know, budget environment. Um, it doesn't mean it's not the right thing. Um, it's just let's, let's be clear uh, uh, that, that I think that's one of, the, one of the elements of the drivers. Because there have been plenty of examples where we're actually doing it right now. Um, I would argue the U.S.-U.K. nuclear relationship is exactly of this notion, right? We're developing something together. Uh, 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 certainly the U.K. You know, couldn't do it without it and is willing to be reliant upon us. Um, it's why Bill, when he was in the building, and CSIS and others, we, we, well, everybody worked so hard on the U.S.-U.K. sort of technology treaty to try to enhance this. So, I mean, there, there are elements uh, um, of the notion that exist, and the issues I think that we're all asking is, is can it scale itself? Um, it has a mythology component to it to the extent of, of we are trying to break down something that actually has never existed, right? This notion that, oh, I'm going to give up autonomy in order to do this in a federated fashion, I think that's a little bit of what Clay and Bob and everybody's been telling you. You never had that autonomy to start with, right? Because the further, then that's the key part of the reality, the further down you go inside the supply chain, the further down you go inside the industrial base, the more this has been ever since the, 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 the real acceleration of globalization, you know, in the 80s and 90s, this has been going on underneath everybody's feet. And I would argue this is just the policymakers catching up with the reality of what's going on underneath. Um, and, and you can see clear examples of where the notion um, has worked not only and has been in play not only from a technological standpoint but also from a, a, a business you know, standpoint of, of the concepts of I'm going to lash my fate to somebody else and together we will do better and, and alone um, we actually couldn't operate. Uh, and the best a couple of examples I can think of is CFM, right, the GE SNECMA joint venture doing commercial aerospace engines. Now, it's instructive about how can that relationship work for as long as it did. They drew some pretty clear lines. You know, for those of you, guys, for those of you who know it or, or don't or, you know, or may or may not be familiar with, with engine technology, but one is focused on the hot engine, hot section of the engine, the other one's focused on the cold section. And by doing that, that's kind of kept each out of each other's hair, and yet together, they're putting together a product that couldn't be done. I can give you plenty of other examples, uh, whether it's the Raytheon Talus joint venture, uh, there have been missile joint ventures that have been constructed that way, et cetera. Where have these worked out the best and where are we seeing the greatest amount of appetite for it, not only on the part of industry but as well as, as government thinks about it? If you start to pot it out, it's in all the areas that are very capital intensive and where we're getting stuck on the wrong end of the cost versus capability curve, right? Where it's starting to go asymptotic on us, that every increment of, incre of additional capability is costing us so much that nobody can do it. And there's one of two ways to break that. We do an innovation that restarts the curve somehow. So I have a whole bunch of UAV guys trying to break the the fixed wing fighter curve, or I have a bunch of cyber guys sort of saying I can break the entire curve because you don't need hardware, I can do it with 10 lines of code, or a way to share the cost of that, uh, uh, you know, of that, of that burden. I mean, the, 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 the JSF, I think, conceptually, right, was an attempt to break the curve, go beyond the notion of the standard teaming arrangements, the standard work shares, and, and, and move into that fashion from a conceptual standpoint. And if you kind of go down the list of where do we have the most amount of, of strain and pain, yeah, it's, in, it's in those areas where the very capital intensive side or what everybody has been calling, you know, uh, low density, high demand assets, right? That's, that's another euphemism for, you know, I wish I had it, but I can't afford it. Uh, and you're seeing it live right now. There are certain countries that don't have heavy lift capabilities and they're entirely relying upon us in order to provide that. So I think the, the issue is not whether the idea makes sense or whether it's not even that it's, it's, it's in operation today. Um, I would submit to you that the industry is more amenable and ready for it, if not already you know, doing it um, behind the scenes in some, way, in some ways. It, it's how do you take the notion and scale it to the level that, that we want to do and in, in what appropriate areas. Yeah. 
All right, thank you very much. So we teed up a lot of great issues here, and let's, let's dig into them. Uh, let me start with this issue that's come up a couple of times about, um, from an industry perspective, um, do we need to change anything to support a federated defense approach? I've heard essentially a, a couple say no, that it's there already, that we're, this is how industry is operating today. Um, but uh, uh, Mr. Stevens also suggested that there is something a little different about the unique uh, defense marketplace that we need to think about. So why don't I direct that, if I could, to you, Bob, and, and, and get you to, to address that. Sure, we're gonna start. I, I do. Th I, think much of this answer is going to lie in what is the definition of a federated defense environment. And like you, I'm still filling in the blanks and what that definition means to me. We have a healthy, well-functioning, globally oriented defense industrial base today. As, as Clay and Pierre highlighted, it's been that way for a while. There is not an F-16, an F-22, an F-35, or a C-130 that takes to the sky unless the global defense industrial base has delivered. You can say the same thing about missile defense, about satellites, about rockets, about ships, um, about all our electronic systems. So we are very familiar with that environment. They, these initiatives tend to be one-off or programmatically defined. So I think one of the threshold conditions I'm still trying to envision is, is whether a federated defense environment starts at a national sovereign level, level with government to government agreements about what the content of their defense industrial base will look like, what will be the rules of fair and open markets on both sides, because what won't work is any one country opening their markets to others and not have a reciprocal opening of markets that is highly reliable not just from the industry perspective, but from government leadership, both in the executive branch and the legislative branch. We've seen a checkered pattern of what is an open market and how accessible can technology be. Some of the efforts that have gone into facilitating the version of federated, let me say the small version of federated defense that, that I described, have been accomplished through really Herculean efforts, having a champion in the Department of Defense, and having a champion in industry who will do all the heavy lifting to navigate an administrative system that doesn't support this at all. In fact, brings out antibodies to try to stop this process. Unless we can address the, those conditions in that environment, I don't think we will have a smooth functioning, reliable market where industry, as Pierre mentioned, with significant capital investments, our time span of discretion is going to be longer than a CR. I mean, it's going to be longer than, than an annual appropriation cycle. It's, we're going to look out 10 and 20 years for these long-term partnerships. Can we, as a participant, be a reliable partner, and can we secure the interest of reliable partners with government support is a significant question to me. I, I think, from, from my point of view, I'd like to understand more how that say that macro market would work to facilitate the, the, the kinds of outcomes we're looking for and the kinds of outcomes we have secured program by program in some very specific ways. Go ahead. So, so um, I want to be careful in terms of sort of saying that, hey, it's, it's, it's all there, right? So uh, the issue of scalability is a massive one, right, mm -hmm. in terms of the notion of the concept. Um, and the reason why this is going to be very hard is because 60, 70 percent of the problem is a cultural one to the extent of how well um, uh, 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 do you, how comfortable are you working in joint ventures, et cetera, which in the grand scheme of things, American companies have a tougher time than, than others who, who have been forced to do that. And um, uh, uh, it'd be interesting, maybe Bill, you might have some insights since you're, you're on both sides of the Atlantic from that perspective. So there's, there's a cultural component to it. There are plenty of speed bumps along. Uh, what, I'm, I, what I guess I'm saying is I would argue there's no huge walls, but there's some pretty high speed bumps along the way, and you listed some of those, right? The export control laws, et cetera, et cetera, that, that sort of, um, that, that all have to be overcome. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, the point that I would make, though, and, and I, it, w it was rightly brought out by, by both Bob and Clay, that the further you go to the visible part, you know, where you're at the, at the political level where you can see the flag on the product, 
I mean, that's what you got to solve. Lots of other things are then going on underneath the hood that are, I think, in the end, reflecting the reality of the global marketplace. What you're talking about, though, is solving the flag part on the product with simple but complex notions of, hey, how about I build this on your behalf and, and offer that? Now, there's a huge component that could be a lubricant to this, and that now gets into why we put so much investment in CQ networks, et cetera, the, you know, the IT side of this, of you know, can you build a scalable system that lets people opt in, out, plug in, plug out? I mean, that's where all these notions of open architectures, et cetera, et cetera, you know, have, a, have a huge role to play. Well, one thing we've proven is you can fit a lot of flags on a JSF, so we just need to buy things with a lot of surface area, it sounds like. Um, Clay, did you want to? I just very quickly want to commit. The answer to your question, in my view, is no. I don't think there's a major policy initiative or a big regulatory change that I can see, as much as I understand federated defense, and I'm a little bit in Bob's camp there, that would make a dramatic difference. I mean, we can't close a base or cancel an A-10. So how in the world are we going to eliminate a capability and go to one of our allies and say, you pick this up and we'll provide this? That interdependency, I think Bob said it very well, for nationalistic and political reasons create giant hurdles that someone has to figure out how to get over before you can consciously, as a Secretary of Defense, saying, we're going to get out of what? The nuclear game? We're going to get out of the fifth generation fighter, a sixth generation fighter game? We're going to get out of the bomber game? I mean, pick a system that we're willing to give up. Liquid crystal displays happen by market forces. It evolved. I believe market forces will take care of themselves because, again, of what Bob said, we have an active, strong, functioning global aerospace system that's becoming more global, not less, as the, as the realities of life extend themselves. One of the reasons that the British made the decision they did is because it didn't make any economic sense to maintain that capability. France is the last bastion of maintaining all those capabilities, and they're going to hang in until they can't hang anymore for nationalistic reasons. And each country is going to form its own opinion like that. And us getting in the middle of that thinking we can define that for the world, I think, is beyond our capability. I think our time is much better spent on making the department easier to do business with so people coming in from the commercial sector or the international sector can do business with the department without adding 20% of cost just for being in the room. And that's about what you do now if you're a commercial company and you say, I'd like to sell something to DOD. So one of the themes that I think is emerging here is that this government-to-government -government relationship, government, government willingness to tackle these issues, what are people willing to give up, what are they willing, interdependencies are they willing to take on, is pretty crucial. And uh, the example was raised of the U.S.-U.K. relationship, Defense Trade Tr Treaty. Of course, that's historically one of the closest government-to-government -government relationships that there is. Uh, could you speak a little bit, Secretary Lynn, about how you've seen that working in what kind of lessons or, uh, you know, that might have, good and bad for us, in how these kinds of relationships work? Yeah, I mean, the, the uh, I mean, I think it's probably not great in terms of how it sets up. I mean, the U.S.-U.K. Uh, treaty that we got, as well as the comparable one with Australia, took an enormous lift in Congress uh, and, and through the Department to move it forward, and you can't think of an easier situation. I mean, this is our closest ally in the world. There's no security threat. We weren't looking at sensitive technologies. There was really nothing in the way, and it took years and an enormous amount of effort. And then at the end of the day, what do we have? I haven't checked in on it uh, much since I left office, but it, I don't think it's being heavily used uh, right now. So w we spent a lot of effort to get something that in theory was absolutely right. Uh, in, in practice, it should have been easy, and it was neither. It wasn't easy, and it hasn't, hasn't been used. So I, it, it doesn't serve, I think, as a great example of the highway we ought to be, ought to be going down. Well, more, more interesting as we get into it. Um, let me talk a little bit about uh, all of you. I have, uh, you know, tr traveled extensively, talked to a lot of senior leaders and other governments uh, about 
uh, where, you know, so this question of what are people willing to, to give up, uh, maybe that's not the most artful way to put it, but, but it's out there. Uh, where are foreign leaders really uh, willing to lean forward and cooperate with the United States and maybe be, um, you know, a little bit dependent on us, but, but I don't think we're focusing in federated defense so much on dependency as much as, um, you know, enabling each other. But where do you see those opportunities being uh, the largest? Would you start? Sure. I mean, a little, little bit uh, towards what Bob and Clay were saying. If you focus on the big, uh, highly visible platforms, the thing that, you know, as Pierre was saying, that have the flag on it, that's, those are going to be the hardest. Uh, it, it's uh, particularly actually in this country, um, a little bit less, I think, in Europe, but still the same. I mean, in Europe, the dynamics of the budget, I think, have driven countries more to the point they realize they can't be the sole producer of every product in their military. So they're already moving. I don't think we've quite reached that point here, although the, the budget is going to take us there. Uh, over time, but uh, I do think when you get un underneath the hood, as as everybody in the panel has been saying, and it's where the content and defense is going anyway. So the electronics, the communications, the all of the the things that are underneath that platform, I think those do not have the same visibility, and they're already globally sourced anyway. So you're just building uh, building on a trend, and you can move them higher up in the supply chain with much less of a, of a political hurdle than you could if you try and take the platform itself. I, I, I think we have, again, plenty of live examples now, right? So heavy lift and transport is, is an area. Training, right? There are plenty of countries that send their pilots here to be trained. Why? Either because they geographically don't have the ability to have lots of space in order to do live training and or you're training your people at a certain amount of time. It's a huge amount of fixed assets in order to have a range and all the simulate, et cetera, et cetera, and, and, and uh, people are getting together in, you know, in, in, in order to leverage it. I mean, uh, it's not too different than, than from you know, the, the commercial world in terms of w you know, where do people look to leverage and, and uh, gain efficiencies through, through combination. It, usually doesn't start at the pointy end of the spear, either on the business side or the government side. It's in the quote unquote back office. Now, how you want to define that back office in government terms, we, we, we can do that, but that's the, that's the places to start. And that's usually, again, where, where industry goes when it comes time to, hey, where do I, do I want to outsource my IT? Do I want to outsource my HR? Do I want to outsource my, my, my blankety blank? Is it really a national imperative to have every European country do their own HR system? I don't know, I could see. A, a NATO HR, you know, people will probably flip out because again, that, that might be another one of these equivalent flag things that if your check came from a, you know, if a sergeant in the military got his check from a French bank, I'm sure he probably would flip out. But, you know, so I, so I exaggerate for effect, but you know, it's, I think there's a lot of those equivalent that, that end up on and what I would call the back office side that, that becomes obvious places. Andrew, what, what I would say, and at the risk of becoming the cynic on the panel, and I apologize if I'm going that direction, but a lot of the people I talked about outside the United States actually don't look forward to doing business with the United States. We're hard to do business with. And, you know, the, the top thing on their list is ITAR controls. Uh, it, we, it, you know, whether they can use it or whether they can export it or how they can use it is very tightly controlled by our regulatory oversight. You know, we could say that's overkill or some goodness for having it, but it, it creates a burden. The biggest opportunities we have when we're selling avionics around the world is using a commercially based ITAR free system, in which case they love it. And we, and we, we have to consciously design around doing that to make that happen. So I'm back to ease of doing business with. Uh, that's the bigger issue here, not what are they willing to get up to get to do that. At the risk of competing with Clay for cynic on the panel. Uh, <laughs> in addition to the, I, we've actually experienced commercial satellite campaigns where the marketing argument for our competitors is ITAR free. That, that's the, the definitive characteristic that brought the competitor home, uh, which is very telling. Uh, beyond that, 
when I've talked to leaders in both government and militaries, I've been surprised at how much they've questioned the confidence of what we're doing here in America. And this is where sequestration, in my judgment, has not helped. We've been the model, as difficult as it may appear to all of us, with the processes we've had to the rest of the world, we've been the model of how to do this right. And the discussions about sequestration, the discussions about continuing resolutions, about government shutdowns, have given rise to a question of how reliable are we going to be as global security partners, whether that's in partnership capacity building or a federated defense or any other manifestation. Who are we dealing with and, and what's the duration of a commitment that I have from you? Because you may come forward with the best of intentions, Clay Jones, um, but you may be impaired at some level in the future of delivering on your commitment. So in addition to streamlining the uh, process in the Department of Defense, you know, I've been struck, John Hamry and I 13 years ago sat on a commission to study the future of the U.S. aerospace industry. I don't commend it to you. Um, <laughs> however, as part of the educational process, I decided to look at how many other of these kinds of investigations have been undertaken, and the, and the short answer is a lot including at least a half a dozen major uh, studies from Hoover One, Hoover Two, FitzU, Grace, the Packard Commission. What struck me is two things. After 70 years of acquisition reform, we have not reformed acquisition. We have not, because we're talking about the very same subjects today as is written in those reports. And if we just did half the things that these experienced erudite leaders suggested we do, we wouldn't be having some of these conversations today. In the PAC, I won't be long-winded. In the Packard Commission, they said funding stability is a huge part of the ability to get efficiencies and investment in the defense sector. Let's go to a two-year defense budget cycle. Not only don't we have biennial defense cycles, we have continuing resolutions and shutdowns and sequester, and we're going into the third year. That would be the antithesis of what the Packard Commission recommended. So is, it, is there any wonder that things are costing more, that there's hesitation in the global supply chain in an understanding of who we're, doing with, who we're dealing with, how can we trust you, how can we rely upon it? So we, we really do have work to do in streamlining the processes and reestablishing a foundation so that this, whatever level of federated defense we seek, and I think it's essential that we have a level of federated defense. Nothing here works without it. The, the worst phrase I think I've ever heard was buy American. Because if someone institutes a buy American policy, all our programs are shut down. Because we don't have the, the, the reach anymore in, in the industrial base here. We rely on that global industrial base. So I think we need to do more to invigorate that. All right, I want to throw one last question out to the group, uh, and then we'll go to audience questions. But I, I want to take this down to, a, uh, we've done a couple of examples, but there's one example that is just irresistible, and I bring it up not because I have Bob Stevens in the room, but I just think it's just so relevant to the discussion, which is the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter program, which is a cooperative program, the largest cooperative program in the history of the world. And uh, I just think we ought to spend a little bit of time talking about how that relates uh, and, and what about it is working. I think there's a lot about it that's working, and I'm sure there are others here who think there's a lot about it that's working also, but uh, and, and what challenges have come up as we've gone through that process? You know, this is where I give huge credit to leaders in the Department of Defense um, who, who did exactly what Secretary Lynn suggested had to be done, to envision a model that would be different from our past practice, even with all the risks attendant. And, and of course, when you suggest to anybody who's done this more than once, we're going to have any one system that satisfies three services and nine partner countries. There's a certain amount of skepticism that comes from that. I think at the outset, everybody recognizes it's going to be heavy lifting. This is not easy to do, but it is worth doing. And while I think the program has been perhaps overly maligned in, in some respects, this program will, in the final analysis, be enormously successful not just for the United States, but for our partner countries and all three services here. It will be a fully functioning, terrific fifth generation, 40, 50 year airplane from which we will get enormous returns on investment. But it took 
conspicuous leadership and, and a willingness to go against the grain of what was usual and traditional and to take on the challenges that were evident and to assemble not only an industrial base in America but a global supply chain in partnership uh, with the Department of Defense uh, leadership as well as members of Congress who, who were skeptical but supported the uh, program and understood it. And I, I, I think it might turn out to be a, a model perhaps a little like our relationship with the United Kingdom on nuclear weapons. I don't know if it's if we can replicate that today, um, just to get the global procurement authority. I mean, in the early days, we couldn't talk to our partners. And every discussion required a technical assistance agreement in place, every one. Can you imagine trying to assemble a global supply chain on a fast-track development program for three <laughs> variants of a fifth-generation supersonic stealthy airplane that hovers uh, and waiting while while well, bureaucracies put forward the authority to simply have a conversation in a conference room and show people who are our partners exhibits uh, on the program. It's better than it was. Uh, if we're going to have a market rather than a program function on this basis, we have a lot of work to do. Yeah, I think the, Bob mentioned the, the, some of the criticisms of the F-35, and, and they're fair in the sense that you know, the F-35 has, has gone over cost, it's gone, gone over budget. I think the impressive thing about the F-35 is that it's not worse than other development programs of sing similar complexity and technological challenge. I, to Bob's point, if you're doing, you know, nine countries, three services, they should have been much, much worse. And we have programs uh, uh, where that's happened. Uh, that, that this is in line with historical uh, efforts, I think, is, is underappreciated as, a, as actually a huge uh, success. Uh, don't normally say, you know, overruns are a success, but here, you know, the, the, the challenge of bringing this kind of complexity uh, into operation always involves those kinds of risks, and those kinds of risks usually show up on the budget and the schedule side. Uh, the second point I think about the F-35 is it does lead somewhat the way forward in that, you know, I, I cautioned about moving platforms into this area, but the way you're going to do it is the way we've done it with the F-35 is you're going to have to share the work. You cannot keep it all, we cannot follow the model we're going to build it here and sell it overseas. And I, I think, you know, Lockheed and the, and the department have done a nice job of managing that, that work share uh, uh, as uh, partner countries uh, come in, they get a work share. It's, a, I'm, I'm sure, extraordinarily difficult negotiation. It's going back to the first point. It's extraordinarily difficult then to control the costs in that kind of environment, and, and I think both, uh, both have been done. Final point of F-35 is, to your federated defense, is it almost has to be the future because we've talked, the prior panel talked a lot about the budget. If you spent any time here, you should have come away very pessimistic that, that the budget uh, uh, deadlock here is going to be broken and that we're going to get out of BCA levels. And if you want to go to a similar panel in Europe, you'll be even more depressed. Uh, <laughs> European defense budgets are even in a, a, a sorrier state. And we can sit and lecture the Europeans or lecture our Congress uh, for as long as we want. I don't think it's really going to change. The, the budgets are going to be what they're going to be. There are other national needs. There are deficits. There's an enormous number of pressures. The challenge is how are we going to do better within the existing budgets that we have? And the F-35, I think, is an example of how we can move towards federated defense and do that. Can I add a quick comment? There, there's a notion that's almost equivalent to the conservation of energy sort of law, right? That there's a, there's a complexity in the system that exists today underneath the hood. We think it looks simple at the top because, you know, I am buying an airplane, it, it's simple, and, and all that complexity, all you're asking to do, I would argue in some ways, is just moving that complexity up into the visible level in order to make the plumbing underneath simpler. And, and the issue is which way in the end works better given all the political realities, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, but I don't think you're gonna change the amount of complexity in the system, frankly. If that's the premise, that's a, that's a falsehood, right? It's just where, where is it and where, where do you see it? When I heard Bill say it could be worse, I heard the voice of my mother-in-law in my head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, 
There is, a, I want to offer you a footnote because there was some very considerable risk taking uh, undertaken in the Department of Defense on the F-35, some considerable investment, and investment in industry, in a technology, moving the design to a digital database. And what enables this global supply chain to work, and it takes some money and it takes some courage, is to throw away the old design tools and get a new design tool set that results in what's referred to as the digital thread. So that everybody up levels their engineering capability, everybody gets on the, the same design uh, architecture, and we do that digitally, then we can share information around the globe. And that sharing of information then allows the global industrial base that is at that level of proficiency, both in design and in manufacturing, to produce against a specification that is sufficiently tight that when the parts come in from around the world, they fit into that airplane exactly as they were designed because everybody's sharing the same content of that intellectual property as compared to, as we used to do it, paper designs shipped out to everybody who translates that paper design on another paper for design engineering that then translates it to manufacturing engineering. We don't do that anymore. And that was a huge investment on, uh, by the Department of Defense and by industry, and I think took a lot of courage, because that violates the rules of wing blocking. We're, you know, we are going to do that on this program, and the scale of the program was substantial. And I think that can prove real, to, to be a viable course of action for other programs in other ways to incorporate facility in a, in a global industrial base. Which, which, oh, by the way, the commercial aerospace industry was already doing. For example, on the 777, that design was working its way around the world, you know, every day as, as different design centers around the world were working on that, as you, as you know. All right. Well, at this point, I will open it up to some audience questions. We've got about 15 minutes left, and we've got some hands. And I think we have folks with microphones who can... Uh, uh, let you get started. Please introduce yourself and then ask your question and keep the questions brief, please, so we can fit several in. Uh, why don't we start here? Thank you. Michael Bruno with Aviation Week Space Technology. Uh, sort of a contrarian question, Tom Enders has talked about he never wants to do an A400 again. People inside the Pentagon talk about how the JSF really wasn't the solution for the individual services. People in Congress say they never want to do me ads again. Could we not be at a tipping point that goes against complex multinational programs? And doesn't that sort of open up a, a, a better buy American or buy French atmosphere? Bob, I think. Uh... Well, I hope that's not the case. I mean, I, those arguments um, I think we've heard before. There have been precursor conditions that give rise to the sense that if we all just come home, if we shut down our markets, if we just do everything here, we'll be fine. But that, that runs entirely contrary to the last 20 years of experience that we have had. There's real vitality in the global industrial base. Anyone who thinks there's a corner on intellectual property is working in an environment that I'm unfamiliar with. I do think that every aspect of American industry can be competitive, but then we start talking about the allocation of scarce resources in money and time and talent. What we ought to do is find out where are these areas where we can work effectively and well together, set out the ground rules to assure fairness and reciprocity if it requires open markets, use the best of the technology that we have, and, and give the customer leverage to, to buy economic, as economically as possible in this environment. Again, I think we love to use the vocabulary of business and economics in our discussions about defense, but we don't act in a fashion that you would recognize in the commercial market to actually get those economic outcomes. So the more we can change our behavior here and invite and embrace the, the global market with standards, and I think the better off we're going to be. It, I don't see us having the ability in, in our country to go it alone. And, and as I said, if, if we had a requirement today to only incorporate that which was designed, developed, and manufactured in America, I don't think I know a company that could deliver a product tomorrow morning. It's even hard to trace the source of the materials. If you want to go back to ore, you know, where was it mined? We live in a globalized world. That's, we're not going to reverse that. I don't think we should want to, but if we did, I don't think it's possible. Just to build on... Uh, Quickly, what Bob said is I, 
I think if you went the direction your question suggests, it would be easier. It'd be politically easier, it'd be easier, less complex, it'd be easier to manage. And the result would be you'd get more costly systems, you'd get lower technology, you'd get less capability. So it, for the, the trade isn't worth it. And, and we do work with other countries around the world in providing for the security of 320 million Americans and friends and allies. And, and we do have security cooperation partnerships, and we would lose every opportunity in interoperability and sustainable, in joint logistics bases, in training. And there is a byproduct in our experience. I cite for you the F-16 program that is long and well established. We have, in, we, the United States, has incredibly good relations in 25 countries because the political leaders of those countries and the military leaders of those countries have worked with the United States military and political leadership in a security cooperation partnership where we got to understand one another culturally, personally, and, and built bonds of friendship within, in, in an industrial um, uh, capacity with jobs and economics. And it's, it's built a fabric of a good relationship well beyond the, the simple provision of an airplane for military service. So there are really derived benefits from these global exchanges where we're more aware of global circumstances, we know one another better, and we can call when we need it. When we, when we mobilize in a complex world today, we're going with partners. I mean, this has been a repetitive behavior over the last 50 years. And you go back and look, last, every, every downturn, there's a reaction of, oh, let me get back to my core, let's get rid of all this other stuff. And then, and then there's a J-curve. You go, you go through that, and then you hit the bottom, and you realize, oh, I don't have enough money in order to do this on my own, and they come right back to doing things together. This is, this is right. It is a, everybody's playing their role in the act, you know, uh, in, the, in the play that, that's getting repeated again. Let me add a perspective you hadn't looked at yet. Uh, you mentioned programs that have uh, cost overruns or troubled past. Let's compare that to the commercial marketplace, 787 done by Boeing, uh, C-Series done by Bombardier, A380 and A330, probably A330 the best of the bunch so far, all of which had issues that didn't have near the complexity or the, the prime level global involvement that the programs you mentioned. So I think we run the risk of masking what the real nature of the problem is with the fact that it happens to be complex technologically or happens to be involved with international uh, uh, partners. If you go back and you trace the troubled programs we've had, they all trace back to fundamental things that are program management 101. Requirements, stability, staffing the program, picking the right leader, managing the configuration. Those are much more the, the roads to doom than is the fact that you're introducing new technology or you have international partners, or it is complex. And I think if we look at parsing out what the real nature of the problem is, we'll find that those four issues are usually at the root of most of these overruns. And those are just, those are things we can control. Less sexy, but things we can control. I'm Bob Hershey, I'm a consultant. Uh, what can be done to get more of this on the internet so that people can have transparency and see what the issues are and what their economic consensus is? Uh, getting uh, appropriate systems where uh, people can have international participation which helps the system. So you're interested in, in transparency and some of this cooperative work that's underway. Um, uh, Bill, could you give us, you have a perspective I mean, from your time in government about how, um, obviously some government government interactions are not going to be public, in a lot of cases they're very sensitive, but in other cases it's part of the process is, you know, uh, is making it public and having, you know, public events and discussions. Putting out policies. Yeah, I, and I guess I haven't seen lack of transparency as a, as a core hurdle or challenge in you know industrial policy in terms of partnering with with nations. I think I guess coming the other direction. I think the internet 
uh, other social media, the, the, the global growth of news media to begin with, is, uh, there's an awful lot of information out there, far more than there was a decade or two ago. So I think uh, the information's out there, it, it's available, it's, it's more accessible. I mean, the challenge is more sorting it than acquiring it. But um, so I, I guess I don't quite go down the same thrust as you did. I can give you an example from the F-35 program. Um, in conjunction with our Department of Defense and the Ministries of Defense in partner countries, we would have supplier fairs. We would uh, have broad area announcements in the countries who were participating, investing partners, and bring in their industry and talk about the program. And as, as I mentioned to you earlier, that some of the challenge was assuring that we had the technical assistance agreements and, and the proper uh, documentation in place. But and they they were widely and well received so that even small businesses in, in a variety of countries had an opportunity to understand uh, more clearly. I thought it was advertised pretty well, although it wasn't done uh, exclusively by us, uh, and, and had a great response and, and was very competitive. You know, when we talk about, well, we want more competition, there's a lot of competition going on, folks, much more than you might think. Well, even lot to lot in serial production where it looks like the prime contractor doesn't change. I would invite you to ask Clay Jones how he feels about competition for the subsystems that he provides because a lot to lot, if you can't meet the expectations of an improving cost curve at quality with delivering on schedule, we're going shopping. Uh, Bill would expect us to do nothing less and he was right in that. We should deliver uh, against that set of criteria. We have an obligation to do it. We have a global supply chain to sample from and we're going shopping. Back here. Yes. My name is Frank Barone. I live in Arlington, Virginia, in DC, and I'm a private investor. So thank you very much for all the things you've done with your companies. We very much appreciate that. Going all the way back to Norm Augustine, who I know very well. I live next door to him in Naples, so we get to talk to each other a lot. My question is a little bit different, and that is, when I talk to the guys that wear the stars on their shoulders or in uniforms, which I did a lot of yesterday because it was Veterans Day, I asked the question that you began to allude to, uh, Mr. Lynn, and that is, why are we not able to take all the various militaries that we have, that are all in our, in our field, so to speak, and divide the war between ourselves? That's what, that's what happens in the real war. The First World War, the Second World War, the Korean War. It seems to me like the Defense Federation has another precedent to that, and that is the offensive preparation at the federated level. The requirements, as you pointed out, are the big driver here. That's the number one item that Mr. Jones talked about here. Why can we not start that issue? You certainly already have a lot of maturity in the production bottom up, but what I don't see here is anything associated with the operational forces. I know the guys in SOCOM, I asked them a lot about that because they're in the Florida area. What are you doing to make sure that your counterpart and you and they can communicate with one another? And as you're talking about on the training aspect of it, pilots come to the United States to be trained because we have resources or whatever we have. So maybe there's more than a single phase to this effectively federated challenge. That is, you've got the industrial base up for the federation to make the parts and the materials logistically supportable, functionally capable, but you also have the requirements come from the top down, which is the issue associated with the warfighter. Where are they going to fit in this? Because I think they are probably really the key. Well, uh, couple of things. Um, one, I think y y the overall thrust of your question is right, is, and I think Bob alluded to this earlier, one of, the, one of the real dynamics for federated defense is that we should basically build systems as we fight. We, we, we fight together. We, we virtually never go into uh, anything alone anymore. We, we engage our allies. We, our, our allies support us. They sometimes lead. We sometimes lead. It's always uh, an integrated effort. To support that integrated effort, you need uh, integrated equipment, very mundane level. You need to be able to communicate. You need to be able to uh, have efficiency of maintaining, efficiency of logistics. So th there's, a, there's a strong operational dynamic. I would uh, fight your uh, analogy to World War II, though. World War II, we largely produced everything and then provided it. It, it wasn't, uh, the, the, uh, our allies weren't in a position to produce uh, that kind of equipment at that time in the world. That isn't the case today, so I don't think that, uh, that analogy would work. I'd offer you a different one, and it doesn't come from defense. It comes from the automobile industry. If you go back, I don't know, 30 years ago, 
It was virtually unpatriotic to drive a, a, a German or a Japanese car. People you know, thought you were stealing jobs uh, from Americans. Now you look at uh, things today, the largest uh, exporter of US built cars in the world is BMW. They build the most uh, cars for export. So the, the whole market has become integrated. The, the, the overseas uh, brought plants here. We have brought plants overseas. The market for automobiles is global. We compete very effectively, but it's no longer a parochial uh, market. It's no longer a market where you put walls around your capability and try and uh, move your product overseas. I think that's the direction. Uh, there's, there's additional challenges with security and technology with defense. It's not a, a simple uh, metaphor, but nevertheless, I think that's the direction that we need to look to be going. And, and there's been a notion of design concepts inside the building of, you know, uh, design for, for exportability, putting that all, all, all the way in at the beginning, that actually runs against a tighter budget environment because that's extra money you spend up front, right? So that's, that's again, systems engineering, all these things are the things that get thrown out when budgets get tight. Uh, 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 but that's, that's one notion that, uh, that leads to it. There's another dilemma that, that also we need to wrap our heads around. You know, systems that we designed for our core customer, you know, for the American military, are usually way overscaled for most other countries, right? A C-cube system for an Army Corps is probably the equivalent to the C-cube system for the entire country of Burundi. So they sit there and go, hmm, how do I plug into that, which a lot of times is where some of the European competitors have a better time in the export market because they're, they're better scaled, and so that's part of the notions, again, of how do, you, how do you build in that kind of scalability so it'll work for the U.S. military all the way down to any one of these, and uh, which is why you're now you're back to the electronic side of this as, as partly the answer, because you know, that's, that's how you get your scalability. Okay, well, we have uh, come to the hour, the 12-15 hour, uh, and before I talk a little bit about the next stage, which is lunch, let me just ask everyone to thank our panelists and add my thanks. added quite a bit to our discussion. Uh, that'll be very helpful. Uh, so the next stage of the forum is lunch. Uh, for the folks in this room, uh, there is food and seating available on the concourse level, which is downstairs, uh, whichever set of stairs or elevators you choose to use. And thank you very much for coming. Mm -hmm.